We've heard a lot of things about grace. But have we taken the time to see what the Bible really says about it? It's time to go deeper into God's Word and get a better look at the many facets of grace that saves us, sustains us, and empowers us to live freely in His amazing grace. Amazing grace. We'll get into the Word. Um, Hebrews chapter 4. And so once again, good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's good to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming. Uh, look at the person beside you. Smile at them. All right. Do they look... How many of you here, you're tired? Raise your hand. Okay. And, wow, that's a lot of people. Okay. Okay. Wow. All right. Look at them again. Are they tired? Do they look tired? No? Okay. Well, this message is for you because we're going to talk about rest today. Okay, so we're going to talk about rest. So tell the person beside you, this is for you. Okay. And so I, we, we've, talked about, <laughs> we've talked about justifying grace, sufficient grace, sanctifying grace. And today we're going to talk about the invitation, uh, the grace of God to invite us into rest. And so that's what we want to talk about today. And so, but the question you might have today, just in case you're asking, how can I find rest in a time of stress, right? In the day and age where it's just so busy, there's just so many things to do and a lot of stuff going on at the same time. Anybody here understand what I mean? Yes. And so, uh, in fact, I was reading an article. They, he said that this generation and no matter how age you are today this current day and age generation is the most sleep deprived generation all right and uh, the new year scientist matthew walker was talking about that he said he said human beings are the only species okay that de that deliberately deprive themselves of sleep every other living creature when they're tired they're sleeping but the uh, humans they will just literally deprive themselves of sleep, right? And so, you know, we're the nat na natural, or what do you call that? The National Sleep Foundation would say that if you're 6 to 12 years old, you need 9 to 12 hours of sleep. If you are 13 to 18, you need about 8 to 10 hours of sleep. How many of you teenagers, you get that? Not very many today, okay? Uh, and they're not answering because they're downstairs, okay? Uh, 18 to 60 years old, you need about 7 to 8 hours of sleep or even more, right? And that's what we're told by the National Sleep Foundation. And so uh, you think about what's going on around us, just the te technological te uh, takeover, right? You are tired, but you're overstimulated because there's a screen in front of you. Um, there, a huge percentage today bring their phones to bed with them. Right? A huge percentage. And so that, that blue light keeps you awake. And it's moving, your brain's still working and functioning even when you're supposed to be sleeping. Somebody said this, the, the enemy of productivity today is not laziness but, but overstimulation. We're so overstimulated because of technology today. Not only that, because of uh, uh, hustle culture. The culture today, let's, let's try to finish and do as much as we can in one day. Let's pack in within 24 hours as much as we can. Anybody guilty here? That's me raising my hand, okay? And so we're all trying to hustle, right? And when we don't give ourselves enough downtime, we burn out. And we're forced to rest. Not only that, money worries and because of you know, these concerns, it pushes us to work harder. We end up burning ourselves out. And then poor coping behaviors. And part of that would be diet because what happens then is, you know, we don't have enough time to cook. We don't have enough time to fix meals. So we eat cereal in the morning, pizza in the afternoon, and drive through in the evening. Okay, the guilty said amen. All right, and so that's, that's what's happening today. And because of these, and of course, you know, because you need to extend energy, you get a dose of caffeine. Again, the guilty said amen, right? And so what happens is we pump caffeine and we hope to be able to put in some more 
um, energy into our day. On top of that, you have this national and global issues, right? So um, it's packed within, you know, your daily schedule. You read this online. You, um, you have all these worries outside the Philippines, within the Philippines, and within your household. There are stuff now that, of course, you're concerned about finances. You know, family members are not talking to each other. Uh, you know, fi yeah, you didn't get to the school that you applied for, right? And some of the, um, uh, you know, results came in the past few weeks, couple weeks. And so you're, how do I sleep? How do I rest? How do I have some downtime? So today, we're going to talk about that. That God is inviting us, and His grace invites us and bids us to rest in Him. Right? And so I want to read from Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, the Son of God, let us hold, hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every aspect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Heavenly Father, we commit to you our time of study in the word and I pray that it would not just be academic, but it would be life-changing. I pray, Lord, that as your word has been spoken from thousands of years ago and it still speaks to this very day, that it would minister to every heart in this room and even those watching online or listening to this podcast in jesus name we pray amen now when you talk about the book of hebrews hebrews is an epistle written by we actually don't know who right and many many scholars in the past thought it was a uh, it was paul but there were, it, they, they compared the apostle, uh, Paul, Paul's letters and Hebrew uh, epistle. Um, it's a different style of writing. And so they thought maybe it's Apollos, maybe it's Luke, maybe it's Barnabas. And to this day, we don't know. But somehow the Lord allowed that letter to be in the canon of scripture today. So that we can learn from the lessons that we're taught through this letter to the Hebrews. And... Uh, some say it was written about 64, 65 AD, maybe uh, even later, 95 AD. But whatever, whenever that was written, the more important thing is the, the Word of God speaks through this epistle to the Hebrews, uh, the church at that time. And so in, in verse 11, the Hebrew writer says, let us Therefore, strive to enter that rest. That word, strive, uh, that word strive is the word to be eager, to expend energy and effort. It's a deliberate effort to get into that rest. You know when you're, uh, when you're doing something and you're, you're focused and you want to make sure uh, this task is accomplished, you do everything that you can to try to hinder or get rid of the hindrances from making you get there. And so he's what, this is what he's saying. Let's get to that rest and get rid of anything and everything that will hinder us from getting there. Now, what is this rest? What is he talking about? Right? How do we enter this rest? And so we see that the, the re writer in Hebrew is saying that this rest is not just relaxation. It's not just getting some time to sleep and not deprive ourselves of sleep. But it's more than that. He says this is resting in the presence of God, resting in His salvation. That we, have, since we have this relationship with God, because the the Hebrew author was addressing, there were people who were falling away from their faith. There was intense persecution, and people were saying Jesus is coming back, and because He has not come back, they were now wondering, is He ever? coming back and so sometimes that's what happens right when people go through difficult seasons or even prosperity sometimes prosperity is a greater test than adversity I you know as a pastor I've seen this and I've seen unfortunately people 
you know, when they're in need or in crisis, they scream and shout and, and cry out to God. And, and it's a good thing. They're coming to God. But when everything becomes comfortable, the God of comfort takes over and they no longer need the God of the heaven and the earth. And so he says, enter this rest and salvation has been given to us through Christ. That there's no need for us to perform, right? There's no need for us to try our very best. We don't need to walk on our knees to get to the church, you know. We don't need to pray long prayers. We don't need, those are still wonderful things. Like reading the Bible is a great thing. Uh, the disciplines are amazing. It's good to actually get into them. But that's not the way to salvation. The way to salvation is through Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. Only through Christ. Now, he says, you know, we enter this rest when we understand we've been saved from our sins, from our past sins. And then we're also being saved from our present circumstances because of this gospel. And that the future hope that you and I have is still because of this Christ that he gave his life to, for us. Now, uh, in the previous verses, I didn't, we didn't read this anymore, but the whole chapter is about rest. And it talks about, in the first verse, it says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, and this is a continual invitation, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Don't, in other words, what he's saying, don't miss this rest. He's giving you this because he understands that if we try to do things on our own, we will be perpetually tired. In fact, not just physically tired, spiritually, because during those days, the Hebrews or the Jewish people were in a Jewish religious system where they had to offer sacrifices so that when they approach God, their sins are atoned for. And so, you know, since we're sinful people, Every so often we, you know, we fall short and we, we, we sin. So there has to be an appropriate sacrifice for that. And so because this, this was the system, how many of you know it'll get into your, in, into your system, not just in your religious system, but in your daily grind, in your daily life that you have to perform. In fact, every single one of us, we end up performing, seeing our value based on performance. And that's what he's trying to set us free from. The good news have been proclaimed. Jesus died, rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he will return. And that you have been approved of because of your faith in Christ. No longer do you have to try to impress anybody. No, nothing to prove, no one to impress. Jesus accepted you for who you are. And by his sacrifice, you now have, uh, a, you, you, you are now received into the family of God. Last night I had a dinner, my wife and I had dinner with some friends. And we were just recounting some of the people in our small group before where it's just amazing how the Lord saved and transformed and sanctified uh, the, the, the people in our group. And one, one guy there who was just, you know, uh, he was, he had a, he was engaged and he, uh, to his, his girlfriend and, but at the same time, he was just jumping from one relationship to another, sleeping around with other women and just, and then, and then he met Christ and then he got, radi he got radically changed and life was no longer the same because the love of my life is not my sin any longer. The love of my life is Jesus. Something shifted. It was a radical shift. Why? Because the good news had been proclaimed. And then not only that, unfortunately, he says there were those who did not share this faith. They did not embrace this faith. Listen, when you don't embrace the faith, when you don't embrace, embrace what Jesus Christ offers us, that you're accepted no matter who you are, wherever you come from, whatever you've done, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for your sin. Whatever you've done, I am accepting you and I will transform you and sanctify you, God says, to become more like the image of my son. But when you don't embrace this, that performance orientation, even in the religious, will carry out in your daily life. You'll end up performing. 
Why? Because if you, un you, don't, un if you don't understand that you've been accepted and loved by God, you will try to get that approval, acceptance somewhere else. And you're, you're, we'll end up just shifting and jumping from one relationship or one career or one gadget or one possession or one vacation to the next, not realizing that those things don't bring ultimate significance. Only Christ will. And so there becomes a performance orientation because we don't embrace the, the faith or embrace Christ's finished work. So we end up working. Instead of embracing the finished work, we work to finish the job that's already been finished. Then there's no rest for the soul. And people try to prove I'm valuable. God already said, you're valuable. You are so loved. I sent my son. You are so valuable. I fashioned you in my own image and likeness. So if you don't understand that, we're going to grab it from somewhere else. That I have this address. That I have this car that I have this girlfriend that I have this job that I have this career which hopefully will bring significance and value to my life and worth but at the end of it all you realize it's not enough because we didn't get it from the right source are we getting this are we following this is so important guys because rest we will not get that until we understand this truth that the Hebrew writer was explaining. And so because of this performance, you end up striving to work for compliments. And even if you get compliments, you don't even like the compliments because it's not enough. You reject, you cannot accept them. You cannot receive criticism because why are you criticizing me? Are you not accepting me? Or you, you, you are compulsively defensive. I have to defend my reputation, my image. I want to make sure people understand who I really am, my worth, my value. We take responsibility for everything. Why? Because para, para me clap, you know, para me applause. So that we work now for the applause of people. If we don't understand that the most important thing is the applause of heaven rather than the applause of men, we will perpetually be working hard. We're overwhelmed or over busy. We tend to blame others because we don't want people to think less of us. So it always is his fault or her fault. We're exhausted. We don't like, the, we don't like failure. There's more. <laughs> we minister, but we don't want being ministered to. Because it's not enough. It's a bottomless pit. We, we like helping people, but when people help us, sometimes we reject it. We don't feel we're valuable enough to receive ministry. Some of you feel that. I don't, I'm not worth it. Don't even minister to me. Just spend your time with somebody else. You see how this works? This is in this, this is in our generation. I mean, I'm not, I'm not talking about a specific generation. This is our world today, our generation, our culture, our day and age today. We try to control people and situations. We're unable to be truly intimate or be personal or, or, or be close to somebody because if you knew who I really am, I'm not sure what you're gonna think about me. But then again, you go to God and says, I know who you really are, and yet you are fully known but you are intensely and unconditionally loved. Lonely, fearful, insecure, compulsively needing approval. You're always checking. Am I good? Okay ba? Okay ba yung presentation ko sa office? Bases every decision on what others think. Constant affirmation. will often defer to others even they don't agree. They disagree. Okay lang. I don't, I don't want to disagree because if I disagree, they might think ill of me. 
That's why we're tired. Because it's, we're working to get this approval. That's not the way to do it. If we understand the salvation that we have in Christ, we've been received. And then our future hope, Lord, thank you that this life isn't all that there is, that life after this life is way better than anyone and anybody can ever describe. That's why in Hebrews 10, 23, he says, let us hold on to the confession of our hope. There's hope. Jesus is the anchor of our hope. Hebrews chapter 6 says, he is the anchor of our hope. There's something to look forward to. If this life is all that you're hoping for or the stuff that you have, the achievements, that's it. That's, it. that's not a lot of hope there. There's injustice, there's corruption, and we will do all we can as, the, as children of God. We will advance God's kingdom and we will see justice. He has shown you, oh man, what is good. Amos, the Bible says, right? What is good to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. That's what the Bible says. We will push that forward. But in the midst of all that, sometimes you still see people get... You see a three-year-old get raped. You see a young kid get killed. What do you do with that? Then you're going to have to just pin your hope on there's something beyond this life. We don't want to be too be heavenly minded with that we're no earthly good. I'm not talking about that. But we want to make sure, Lord, there's something beyond this life. That's why we get tired when we don't understand what we've been saved from and what we've been saved for. We'll just work, work. But I want to focus on the present circumstances. We enter into the rest of God when we see him at work in the present circumstances. Verse 14, look at this. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession. We have a great high priest, Jesus, and listen, um, Jesus entered, sorry, the high priest rather in the Jewish religious system, they would enter from the outer courts or from the outside to the outer courts, to the inner courts, to the holy place, to the most holy place. There are stages to get into. And the most holy place, the only person who can get in there is the high priest. Once a year, he enters the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is. Right? And so he gets in there, he offers a sacrifice, and he pours blood so that when God looks down from heaven, he covers, or the blood covers, the blood of the lamb, the bulls and the goats, will cover the sin of the people. So when God looks down, he's he doesn't see the sin, he sees the blood that covers. Jesus comes, and John the Baptist declares, behold, the, son, the lamb of God, who what? Covers? No, he takes away the sins of the world. No longer does he just cover, he takes the sin away. And he did not just, he did not come from the outer courts into the Holy of Holies. He came from the very presence of God in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, who went out from heaven into your life and in mine in this planet so that you and I can be reconciled back to the Father. That's why he's the great high priest. And so he says, because of this, hold fast onto this confession. Our profession of faith, our faith in him, hold on to this. Because this is not just old wives' tale. This is not just a story. This is not Dr. Seuss. This is truth. Verse 15. The high priest that's been given us has been tempted in every way and yet without sin. The full extent of temptation upon him yet without sin. Temptation is not a sin. And every temptation that you've ever experienced, Jesus experienced. Because people will say, I can't, Jesus won't be able to relate with me or I can't relate with Jesus. He's the son of God. He's God. 
Yes, but he also went through. That's the, that's the importance of the incarnation. That's why he had to come so that he can become like one of us. He understands your pain. He understands your trauma. He understands every temptation and trial you've been through. See, if, if you're in, uh, let's say you're in a huge debt today. Let's say millions, right? I can sympathize and say, I sort of understand your pain of being in debt because I've been in debt before and you know, I had to pay a few thousands of pesos to my friend. But the extent of your debt is nothing compared to the extent of my debt. And not only that, I, while I am willing to help you and sympathize with you, I have no ability because if you're tens, and, uh, tens of millions of, of pesos in debt, I cannot write a check because I don't have it. I don't have the resources to pay for your debt. But Christ, he's not only willing, but he is also able to provide you the resources so that he can get you out of your situation in time of need. You can find grace and mercy in time of need. And then finally, verse 16. Let's with confidence draw near. Sabi niya, because this high priest has been before us, have gone before us, and he represented us to the Father, and he's now seated at the right hand of God, Hebrews chapter 12, if you read there, he's now seated at the right hand of God. We can approach the throne because he's there. He's for us, not against us. And some of you need to hear this. Jesus is for you, not against you. He's not with a whip thinking or, 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 or finding or looking for a moment where he can whip you down. He's there. He's interceding. And see, that's where we can find rest. When you realize, I've been saved. My faith in him has allowed me to be saved. I'm redeemed. I have been, uh, I've been brought from darkness to light. Not only that, my future hope is secure. If I go out of there and God forbid, if I get run over by a car, I'll be fine, I'll go to heaven. And in the present circumstances, I know I can have rest because Christ is my high priest. Jesus has gone before me. See how this is important so that we can have rest today. That you don't have to perform. I don't mean you don't have to work. Your boss calls you tomorrow. Where are you? I'm home resting. Right? <laughs> okay? don't, don't do that. Okay? I don't mean that. Right? I mean you can rest in all the stuff that, in the midst of all that's going on. Lord, I'll be fine. Lord, I have value. Lord, I am accepted. Lord, I am welcomed in your family. I'm not rejected. I'm not abandoned. I'm not dismissed. I'm in. That's who you are. Let's bring application and we'll end. <clears throat> Enter God's rest by trusting him with your salvation. Some of you, you need to come to Christ today. And part of that is repentance. Part of that is letting go of sin and saying, Lord, I will be forgiven of my sin. Yes, but you, you're gonna have to release that sin and say, Lord, I don't, wanna, I don't want this. I want you, not this. And then break from this performance orientation. So I'm gonna pray for that in a moment. Because some of you, this is tiring. It's incredibly tiring. Because you're performing, you're performing, you're performing. You're not even sure if you're being accepted by your boss, by your mom, by your dad, by your tita, by your lola. Augustine, he said it this way. You've made us for yourself, O oh Lord. And our heart is restless until it finds its rest in God. In you, Lord. 
It's a beautiful statement. Until we find rest in Him, we will not see ultimate rest. Number three, rest in the joy that you have a relationship with God. And this is, this is important because um, you've heard this and that, that Christianity is not a religion, but it's a relationship. And, and, and some people um, blow that up and it's just, it just, it gets weird. But here's what it, it's, it really means. It's like, I don't have to try to do a set of rules to get into the presence of God. I have a relationship with this King through Christ. And in this relationship, I can enjoy. The question, do you enjoy your relationship with God? Because if it's a chore, then it's not a relationship. My 11 year old son, I can tell him Monday, you hug me, Tuesday, you kiss me, Wednesday, you know, you give me a high five, Thursday, I can give him a list and he may do it but if he does it out of a chore because there's a list so that I can give him his allowance, how many of you know that's not a relationship? That's obligation. And so coming to the church and just clocking in, that's not relationship, that's obligation. And so my prayer is that you would discover the joy of having a relationship with God. That would be my prayer for you. Because until we understand that, everything else will just be an obligation. And let me read Matthew. You, you've heard Matthew 11. When Jesus says, come to me, I'll give you rest, right? Eugene Peterson's rendition in the message version. He says, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. Some people have lost their life. I mean, not literally, but they're just, they're just existing. There's no life. There's no overflow. You're just existing. You're just going with the flow. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. In other words, those are terms of relationship. He says, walk with me, and he says, work with me. He didn't say, work for me. Where in the world do we, you know, sometimes we, we end up working for him. And, and that's, a, that's a noble declaration. I'm, I'm working for the king. But he doesn't want us to work for him. He wants us to work with him. Because I will build my church, Jesus said. Who's going to build it? You? No, Jesus will. Work with me, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn, look at this. Learn the enforced rhythms of grace. Because some of the stuff that we do every day, it's forced. Some of the things that we actually end up doing, it's forced. We're pushing, we're, we're grinding, we're, let's just hustle, let's do this. But this is way better. On forced rhythms of grace, I won't lay anything heavy ill fitting on you. Keep company. Again, those are terms of relationship. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. The, um, the other day I was talking to my eldest son and he was talking about um, this book he's been reading. And he was talking about... Um, just the commoditization of everything. Everything's getting commoditized, right? Um, there's always monetary value to everything. And um, we're talking about commoditizing time and space. You know, space has been commoditized. And if, it's, if space is commoditized, it's unhealthy for the environment. And so he was talking about, um, you know, space now. Every space is for sale and, you know, like malls today don't have a first floor CR because they need to make sure it's commoditized, right? Uh, they just put it in the second floor. You just walk up there if you want to go CR, right? And so everything is commoditized. The real estate, you know, it's, it's ridiculous how expensive re real estate here in BGC is, right? So everything's commoditized. Even time, time now is commoditized. I ha you pay for my time. 
You pay for my time because my time is precious and truly time is precious and I understand completely. But if we commoditize time with God, that's dangerous. You cannot commoditize relationship. You cannot commoditize relationship because I can't tell God, Lord, 30 minutes, huh? Because next, because after this, I'm going to go to work now. You wait. Uh, when I come back, wait for me, okay? When we commoditize relationship, that becomes a problem because we say there's value and, and that's when it becomes a chore. I have to do 30 minutes with God. I have to. But what if your time with God is not 30 minutes, but your time with God is the whole day? What if I go to work, I'm with God. I am driving, I'm with God. I am uh, playing basketball, I am with God. I am in the gym, I am with God. I am eating my lunch, I am with God. Well, the whole day becomes now a quiet time. How is that? Now that's relationship. That's not commoditizing your time. Are you getting this? This is, this is hope this is making sense. Uh, Preston Sprinkle in his book, Caris, Grace talks about he describes when God created heaven and earth and God created man and in his perspective this is he says it beautifully puts it says God takes Adam by the face puffs the divine breath into his lungs he desires to be face to face with Adam he could have just by his word Adam was created he did. He formed and fashioned and forged man from dirt. And then when Adam opens his eyes, he sucks in the sweet air. He finds himself in the presence of a God ecstatic over his greatest work of art. Do you realize that when God spends time with you and you spend time with God, he's ecstatic. The Bible says in Zephaniah chapter 3, he, he dances over you and rejoices over you with singing. Do you know that your God sings? Do you know that God sings? And the Bible says He sings over you because He rejoices over you with singing. Because He wants to have a relationship with you. I was, from that book, I was, uh, I, I printed, I had a, a copy printed, or at least a, a, a f statement printed. I'm going to read it to you because I can't, I, don't, I can't do justice if I don't read it this way. Cynthia okay, said this, bad girls or bad little girls get thrown away. She reasoned when she was five years old because she found out she was adopted. Bad little girls get thrown away. So that was her perspective. Her parents gave her up. I'm a bad girl. No value to be thrown away. She didn't understand how her parents could give up their child if they loved her. So Cynthia logically concluded that she was unloved and unworthy without value. And all humans crave value. It's in our DNA. So Cynthia tried to satisfy her uh, craving in unhealthy, unhealthy ways. Maybe sex will give me value. She thought, I want to feel happy. I want to feel loved. So I'll give it. I'll give my body to everybody and anybody who wants to spend time with me. When Cynthia was around 14, she was sexually abused by a guy in his mid-20s. Then she explored the value of alcohol or just explored value through alcohol, drugs, more sex, slashing her body with a razor. I hated myself with a passion, Cynthia said. I didn't need people to put me down because I did it fine from the time I woke up until the time I went to bed. This is the narrative in her mind. The inner dialogue that went on in my head was, I was stupid, I was not wanted, I was ugly. The only thing I was good for was sex. And so a few years later, Cynthia met Christ. Jesus from her miry and, and muddy pit. He took her out from that pit. Cynthia found Jesus and and the one who crowned her with glory and honor, the pain of her past will never fully leave her, but neither will it condemn her. I have intrinsic value no matter what she says. She discovered that. She discovered, Cynthia says, just because God made me. Though she was unwanted and abused, God crowned her with beauty and love. 
And, and I, I read that and it was a powerful testimony because this was a young lady who said, Lord, now I know. I don't have to perform. I am accepted and loved because of what you've done for me and because of how you fashioned me. I don't have to get it from somebody else. Are you there today? Do you understand that? Do you understand that, that you're so valuable, somebody paid the price of your death? That you don't have to die. That's why you don't have to give yourself away to stuff that you know will hurt you. Because I'm valuable to God and He's valuable to me. Therefore, I'm not going there. Because he is so, he's my priority. That's not my priority anymore. You know, uh, let me try to end this. Um, you know, the, you see it all around BGC, the scooters, the electric scooters, the stand-up scooters. You see them all over BGC now. Um, interestingly enough, I see them on C5. <laughs> I see them on EDSA. <laughs> and so, yeah. It's kind of dangerous, uh, but uh, I guess people really want to beat the traffic. Uh, I have one here, okay, I, I'll, I'll show you. Is, is that the scooter there? Um, and I, just uh, as a, as to end this illustration, or end this preaching with this illustration, you know, you have this scooter. There's a couple ways you can, you can uh, ride the scooter. You can go on it and you can push, right? You can push, right? You'll go quite far, right? Oop. You go some, some length, right? But how many of you know after several kilometers, you get tired? You get tired. If you don't understand that this is an electric scooter, it's powered, there's a source of power. And then you can push a button and then you'll be fine, right? And so I, I think about how sometimes you wonder you're tired because you're pushing and pushing, and pushing, and pushing. Lord, I'll do this. I'll call, don't call me, I'll call you. When I need you, I'll call you. Not understanding the resource available for us, he wants to give you rest. That he carries you around and that, that his grace is sufficient, that he will be with you every step. In fact, certain times, he carries you through that. Can we just bow our heads and pray? Just be quiet for a moment. There's a lot of stuff we talked about today. It's actually good to be quiet because sometimes we world so noisy. Our thoughts are so noisy. We don't have time to slow down. of the moment to say, Lord, speak to me. fidgety or restless and the restlessness ends up in exhaustion 
where you're actually wanting us to rest. That's why you're giving us a time of quietness. And so Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today. First and foremost, let us find rest in the fact that because Christ died on the cross, we have acceptance. And then that our future, secure, future hope is secure. But Lord, in the present, we can also have rest because you are our high priest that has been through the heavens and back. And now you're seated at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf. And you're not just willing, but you're also able to provide, protect, do what is necessary. And so Lord, in the quietness of this moment, I pray that your peace that goes beyond any human knowledge to guard our hearts. Let's all stand. Let me pray. Lord, I, I pray as we leave today that these thoughts remain. Lord, I know over lunch or as we drive home, there will be a million other things that will cloud or actually crowd our thoughts. But I pray that by the Holy Spirit of God, let these truth from Scripture remain. And may we do something about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, great weekend.